I work for my hometown's a local paper as a reporter. Being a small Appalachian community, any newsworthy happenings in those parts occurred sparingly. So when an opportunity arose to cover a paranormal group investigating a nearby national forest, I thought it would make a compelling story. Known as SCAR, Supernatural Cryptid Anomaly Researchers, they were filming a docu-series after having modest success with a previous documentary. SCAR gained some notoriety when they released strange unknown recordings that they captured on an expedition in western Pennsylvania that even got attention from some mainstream news outlets. They conducted expeditions from the spring to fall, primarily visiting locations throughout the northeast United States where they looked into uh, supported stories of cryptids, hauntings, and other unexplained phenomena. Scar was here looking into Bigfoot reports, which I learned came out of this area fairly often. I never really dwelled on whether such a creature could exist, but their arguments and hypotheses admittedly kept me open to the possibility. Our base camp was a primitive site in a remote section of the forest that had no cell phone reception, and was miles from the nearest house or paved road. The team was quite impressed with my prowess and know-how, probably figuring a young woman like myself would be out of their element in the wilderness. In actuality, I have always been an outdoor enthusiast and I will participate in anything involving camping and hiking. The team consisted of five individuals, who dubbed themselves as ordinary people exploring the unknown and unexplained. Scar was founded by Brayden, the director, Shane, their tech and equipment guru, and Corey, who performed most of Scar's PR and communicative duties, Mitchell, who wrote the show and organized expeditions, and Devin, their main camera operator, were younger than the three founders and they were closer to my age. What I found interesting was how these individuals couldn't be any more different from each other appearing to have nothing in common beside a mutual infatuation for the unknown. Their little team was certainly a testament to how people can still have common interests despite coming from all walks of life. We didn't do much that first day, which was mostly spent setting up camp, filming the team members answering questions and reciting monologues. That night was relatively uneventful. After setting up shop, we cooked dinner and finalized our itinerary for the next two days. Mitch, Devin, Shane, and myself briefly ventured out to get a feel for the area and to do a few of what we were called vocalizations and wood knocks, methods they believe are how Bigfoots communicate. They didn't get any responses and we called it a night after about an hour. I interviewed each team member on the second day and was also questioned by Brayden for their docuseries. We then scouted these spots where our night ops investigation would take place, and walked a stretch of riverbank looking for prints. I was impressed at how much research and preparation went into these outings, and while the degree of belief in Bigfoot varied among each individual, their professionalism and organization were exemplary. I actually became really excited about the night investigation. We had split into two groups, the mobile team, Mitch, Devin, and myself, and a static team, Shane, Corey, and Brayden. We would hike to a swampy marsh while the static team parked alongside a road, one to two miles away, and periodically emitted a call blast, playing amplified animal and alleged Bigfoot calls over a speaker. We would post up at the swamp for a few hours, before bushwhacking back to the road and reuniting with the static team. We were dropped off at 11 p.m., and took roughly 90 minutes to reach the swamp, where we hunkered down for an hour before making any knocks or vocalizations. Armed with red headlamps, digital recorders, a camcorder, and thermal imaging, Mitch and Devin thoroughly scanned our surroundings, looking for any signs of movement where they weren't filming. Intrigued by their use of red light, Mitch, who I might add was the most attractive among the five of them, explained that many animals couldn't perceive red light, and it was easier to see in the dark with than white. The teams communicated with radios that, on Mitch's insistence, we only had one of, which got pretty spotty at times due to the distance between our groups. We stayed at the swamp until 2.30 in the morning, 
during which Mitch and Devin did a few vocalizations and one knocks. Remarkably, they had some potential activity. A fake groaning howl after Mitch did a call, two potential knocks in response to one of Devin's, and a deep, woeful wail about 20 minutes after a call blast that both teams had heard. Ironically, I wound up being more animate about the responses we received than Mitch and Devin. While encouraged by the activity, they reminded me there were a million other things those noises could be, and probably were before a Bigfoot. Using power lines crossing the swamp as a visual reference, since they ran parallel in the direction that we were going, we bushwhacked over a mile into the woods before reaching a brook that Mitch said marked our halfway point out to the road. We stayed at this spot for another hour, doing more calls and knocks, including my first Bigfoot call, but had no additional activity. It wouldn't be uncommon for them to figure out that they're not communicating with one of their own, Mitch told me after doing a set of wood knocks. So, unless they move in for a closer look, they'll pretty much go dark for the rest of the night. We stayed at the brook until 4.30 a.m., when the lack of additional activity prompted Mitch and Devin to call it a night. Everyone was tired, and the possible activity from earlier ultimately made these night ops a success. We found a crossable section of the brook that Devin and I traversed without incident. Mitch, however, took a misstep and sank up to his thighs in mud. My foot's caught under like a root or something, Mitch said in a flustered tone, unable to shake himself free. Yeah, I'm stuck. I'm gonna need like a rope or something. By Mitch's estimates, we were 20 to 30 minutes away from the road. Despite having reservations about leaving him alone, he insisted Devin and I meet the others. After informing the static team of our dilemma, Devin and I headed out, leaving Mitch with the radio. I give him a lot of credit for staying there by himself, stuck like that, in the middle of the night and the middle of the woods. I said to Devin, who nodded in agreement, He'll be fine. This isn't the worst predicament I've seen him in. He replied with a slight smirk forming across his face. I noticed how you were looking at him, though. What do you mean? I asked, blushing while trying to play dumb, despite knowing exactly what Devin meant. Come on, don't BS, BSer, Devin said teasingly. I laughed bashfully, thankful that we were having this discussion in the middle of a remote forest, where nobody could eavesdrop. Maybe I should have gone back by myself so you guys could have gotten to know each other a little more. Oh, shut up, I uttered giddily playfully pushing Devin as we walked. I'm serious, he said in between chuckles. There's no way you let one of us walk this alone, but the good news for you is that I think he's also interested. Devin eventually changed the subject and told me a few stories about some of the shenanigans he and Mitch got into, while also noting the irony of Mitch forcing them to take one radio. Shane wants each team to have at least two radios, Specifically in case something like this happens, Devin said chuckling. Mitch doesn't like bringing two because they both go off at once when someone says something. He thinks noises like that will deter anything nearby. Especially since he's the kind of person who always has to be right. The others won't let him live this one down. And we walked for another 15 minutes when something caught Devin's eye. Is that a person? He whispered coming to an abrupt stop. About ten yards in front of us was a slender human shape standing with their torso backwardly bent across a narrow tree stump. The moonlight only revealed its vague outline, which didn't react to our presence. Despite feeling uneasy, we warily approached the motionless figure, and gasped in fright as its details became clearer. It was indeed a person, a man to be precise, he was held in this awkwardly bent posture by a tree stump's narrow pointed tip, which was impaled through his chest. It was hard to infer much about the man based in his clothing. Light beige, cargo pants, boots, and a forest green button-down, most of which were deeply bloodstained. The top half of his head was missing, and the man's mouth hung agape, being permanently frozen at mid-scream. We have to call someone, Devin said, staring nervously at his cell phone, which had no service. 
Whatever killed this guy did it recently. Like tonight recently. And it's definitely still nearby. What about Mitch? I asked. Which only made Devin, who was visibly shaken by the grisly sight, even more uneasy. He can't stay out here alone, Devin said. And I'm going to take his eyes off the body. We should get back to him. Get back to the brook and take it from there. And we reversed course and hurried back to Mitch, speculating about what living in these woods could have killed that man along the way. I think he may have been with the Forest Service or one of those branches, Devin remarked. I saw a rifle in the ground next to his pack, which had some kind of logo on it. I couldn't see what it was though, but it looked pretty official. Why didn't you take it with us? I asked about the rifle coming to a halt. It's a crime scene, Devin quickly replied. We would probably get in more trouble if we touched anything. I didn't want to say anything, but... But what? I asked, staring sharply at Devin, who was clearly unnerved over what he was about to say. Devin sighed. Pretty sure that I saw a footprint or two. Devin revealed before he resumed walking. Human footprints. Barefoot human footprints. So I don't think an animal killed that guy. Devin, who was more of a skeptic, immediately dismissed any possibility of the culprit being a Bigfoot, assuring me the prints he saw were actually human. We agreed not to tell Mitch, who we heard talking on the radio as we neared the brook, or at least wait until he was freed. When we got closer, however, it became evident that the radio chatter we heard was between Brayden and Corey. Mitch was nowhere to be seen upon returning to the spot. While Devin called for Mitch, I found the radio lying at the base of the tree next to the muddy bank. Did Mitch throw the radio? I thought while staring at the device. I was about to fill in the static team on our current situation when Devin screamed my name and stumbled back from the brook, losing his footing and feverishly gesturing with his trembling finger as he stumbled. Following the direction that he pointed, I dropped the radio and cupped my hands over my mouth. Sticking out from the mud were the bloody stumps of Mitch's severed legs. Shining my flashlight on an overhanging tree limb protruding over where Mitch once stood revealed more gruesome details. Blood smeared on parts of the limb was still dripping, while bits of flesh and skin were visible within its appendages. Whatever did this to Mitch must have attacked him from directly above, I thought before spotting something circular and white glistening in one of these smaller branches. Initially noting whatever it was had a red tadpole-like tail, I began retching upon realizing that it was a human eye. After my puking episode, I took a few recollected breaths before grabbing the radio, but was bear-hugged by a pair of arms that violently dragged me from the brook. We gotta go now! Devin exclaimed as he hauled me away until I ran on my own two feet. I heard something big rustle in the nearby brush that further motivated me to follow Devin's lead. Sobbing in between quick, frantic breaths, I kept my eyes fixed on the back of Devin's head while running through the woods, feeling certain that I heard thumbing footsteps coming from behind us that were effortlessly keeping pace. We didn't stop running, even when the road came in sight. After getting this far unscathed, however, I lost my footing and fell hard when we had reached the dirt road. Devin quickly came to my aid, but I shoot him away to have some space while regaining my composure. Oh, we gotta find the others, Devin said in between breaths, standing hunched over alongside me, grasping his knees. Oh, we gotta get going, Aria. We're sitting ducks out here. It felt like my legs physically gave out, so attempting to stand at that time would be an adverse task. Devin sensed this and pulled out his thermal monocular to scan our surroundings. A few seconds into his 360 degree survey, he quickly lowered the camera and emphatically pointed at a pair of oncoming headlights. That's them. I think that's them. Devin said eagerly with some giddiness in his voice. Seeing the headlights was rejuvenating and gave peace in mind, knowing that we wouldn't be out here much longer. I got into my wobbly feet and walked up alongside Devin, who like myself was matted in sweating dirt. Devin stepped back when the car drew nearer, which was when I noticed the worried look on his face. That's not Brayden's truck, 
he said, clearly unsure whether we should stay or run. After stopping about 10 feet from us, a man and woman emerged from the vehicle. The pair looked clean and very approachable, their eyes showing genuine concern as they took tentative steps towards where we stood. Do you guys need help? The man asked, his sincere, sympathetic tone causing me to yet again break down in tears, while Devin began explaining our situation. My name's Gabby, the woman who walked up to me said, while Devin spoke to the man. That's my future brother-in-law, Tobias. Are you hurt? You guys don't look okay. We, our friend is dead, was killed, in the woods, I stammered, while jitterily pointing in the direction from which we came. We have to get someone, have to call for help. While offering me some water, I noticed the gold bracelet Gabby wore that had a pink heart-shaped charm. Graciously taking the bottle, I took a few gulps and finished catching my breath before being able to speak coherently. That's a nice bracelet. I heard myself blurt out as I was hit with a sense of calm. I'm Arya. Looking at her wrist, Gabby smiled and politely chuckled. Well, that's actually why we're here. Gabby said before ushering me towards the car. We're looking for my sister, Claire. I nodded at Gabby as we rejoined Devitt and Tobias by their SUV. We're looking for Bigfoot. I muttered softly. They'll help us find the others, Devin said, motioning for us to get into Tobias's vehicle. We climbed in the back, relieved our nightmare ended before it could start, but we're still shaken by what we saw. We're looking for his fiance, Claire, who vanished here a few days ago. Devin told me as we sat in the car, while Tobias and Gabby went to get some blankets from the truck. Gabby's sister, I added, to which Devin nodded. They're going to get us to help quicker, he said softly. I was distracted by another set of headlights approaching from behind the SUV. Thinking that it must have been the static team, I was surprised when a black two-door jeep pulled up alongside Tobias and Gabby. They briefly spoke with the driver before he rolled forward and stopped in front of the SUV. Who was that? I whispered to Devin, while we watched Tobias and Gabby continue speaking to the driver. Do you think they've got something to do with what happened to Match? Devin motioned for me to stay quiet when Tobias and Gabby started to head back to the car. You're in luck, Tobias said as he and Gabby got into their seats. That was the game warden. We told him what's going on and he's taken us back to the station. What about the others? I asked with visible concern. They're still out there with whatever had killed Match. He wants us to get to the station first and then we'll find your friends, Gabby said while handing me a blanket. It's only a few miles down the road. Tobias remotely closed the trunk before he started following the jeep. Nobody said anything for the first few minutes, which I spent scanning the road for any signs of the static team. So you're looking for Bigfoot? Gabby asked, breaking the timid silence. Devin and I nodded. Devin and the others are investigators. I'm covering them for the paper that I write for. I replied, tightly hugging the blanket. Where'd you get that bracelet? Well, I made it, actually, Gabby said, looking down at the heart-shaped trinket and smiling. I made one each for myself, my sister, and her daughter. My niece. The one you're looking for. Gabby nodded. Her daughter went missing a few years ago. Gabby continued lightly tapping her bracelet's heart-shaped charm with her finger, and she's been searching for her ever since. I made the bracelets right before I last saw my knees. I still remember putting it on her little wrist. My eyes locked into the rearview mirror when I saw a brief flash of something light red. About a week ago, Claire's search brought her here, Gabby continued. She arrived earlier this weekend and nobody's heard from her since. And that's why you guys are here. Devin asked, you're looking for your sister and niece. Gabby's smile vanished and was replaced by an expression of a shock and panic. She screamed, but it was drowned out by an even louder, deeper, guttural shriek as the reddish-white figure sprung from the trunk. Plopping in the back seat between Devin and I, its slender arms violently thrashed about, trying to grab one of us with its massive, oversized hands. 
The few glimpses I caught of our attacker revealed it was a man with bare reddish beige skin, covered by light ashy gray blotchy patches. I noted its roundish jaw, massive forehead, green eyes, scrunched nose, and a few small clumps of scraggly gray hair growing from his balding head. The entire car erupted into screams as the deranged maniac went straight for Gabby and Tobias. Failing to control violently swerving the SUV, Tobias couldn't simultaneously focus ahead of him and fend off our attacker. Unaware of a sharp turn that nobody spotted until the jeep ahead of us had rounded it, he was engaged with the monstrous assailant savagely clawing at him when his car drove off the road down an embankment. The SUV quickly picked up speed before crashing into a small tree, a sequence that unfolded in seconds. I was dazed but managed to open my door and plop onto the ground. Crawling from the car, I slowly got on my back, only to watch the tree Tobias's SUV had crashed into snap completely. The car resumed sliding downhill, whose brake lights signified its location while careening down the slope, before getting swallowed by the darkness. All I could do was gasp and helplessly extend my hand when this happened before laying back down. Unable to cope with my distorting blurry vision, pounding headache and excruciating body aches. Minutes later, a few gunshots rang out, after which someone made their way down the incline to my location. The first thing I saw were a pair of muddy boots and light beige cargo pants. The darkness prevented me from making out any of the person's facial features, but I saw that he also wore a forest green button down, his clothes reminiscent to those worn by the corpse Devin and I had found. I heard the man mutter, Oh shit, along with something along the lines of, this'll just make things harder. I faded in and out of consciousness, later learning that I suffered a nasty concussion. All I remember was being dragged back onto the road, thrown in a trunk. Upon finally coming back through, I lay on my side, still suffering from a pulsating head and body ache. I tried moving but realized that my hands and feet were tightly bound. Despite feeling so groggy, the panic that set in while comprehending my current situation manifested as a knotty queasiness. In examining my surroundings, I was laying on a dirt floor in an L-shaped enclosure with concrete walls. Looking directly above me, my confines didn't have a ceiling, and I quickly noticed a partial set of stairs that cut about seven or eight feet from the ground. I was trapped. You're awake. I heard a female voice say that, which instantly revitalized my alertness. A silhouette emerged from around the corner. It squirmed and crawled like a limbless life form, which was when I realized that it was another person, whose limbs were also tied. She looked very thin and frail, her pale skin clothes and scraggly dark red hair covered in dirt and grime. She had a small face with animate blue eyes whose intent hopeful stare locked with mine. You can free us, the woman said who maneuvered toward a pipe sticking from the ground. If I push this pipe down, the other end will jut out of the ground right by you. Its edge is sharp enough to cut through your rope. Not waiting for my response, she pushed on the extruding pipe which slowly sank into the ground. Just as she has said, the pipe's serrated opposite end rose from the ground right where I lay. I slowly nudged towards the pipe and feverishly rubbed the twine around my hands against its jagged edge. It took a few minutes to cut through the rope and untie my feet, all while ignoring the debilitating pains and sores plaguing my body. I was a little unsteady standing, but I managed to untie the woman. While getting up, something around her wrist got stuck in the pipe. She tried shaking free but had to manually unsnag herself which was when I noticed a bracelet she wore had gotten caught. It was gold with a familiar looking pink heart shaped charm dangling from its chain. It took a second but upon remembering where I saw that same exact bracelet before, the realization hit me like a knockout punch. Claire? I heard myself ask the woman. The woman stared at me blankly. You know my name? She asked suspiciously posturing herself like she was ready to attack or defend at a moment's notice. I was with your sister Gabby earlier, I said, stepping back and putting up my hands to indicate that I meant no harm. Her and Tobias, your fiancé, 
They picked me and my friend up. They're here looking for you, Claire. Do you know where we are? Why we're here? Gabby and Tobias are here. Claire asked with surprising concern as she eased her uptight stance. I was about to reply, but Claire continued speaking. Let's worry about getting out of here first, she quickly said, wiping away muddy tears from her eyes before turning towards the out-of-reach staircase. Do you think you can give me a boost? I'll be able to get you up afterwards. It took a few tries, but I gave Claire a boost using my intertwined hands for her to climb under the stairs. It took a little longer to pull me up since I still lacked adequate upper body strength and required Claire's assistance. Especially for someone who had clearly been trapped in that hole much longer, I truly admired Claire's persistence and tenacity, casting doubt on my ability to possess such strength if I was in her position. After emerging from our confines, I saw we were being held in the basement level of an old abandoned dilapidated foundation in an advanced state of ruin. The sky was a luminous shade of dark blue, indicating nighttime was transitioning to dusk. Unsure what to do next, I patted myself down and cursed when I realized my phone or any other communicative devices I had were in my possession. I'm pretty sure you took my friend this way, Claire said, nodding towards a trail that I wouldn't have noticed if she didn't bring it to my attention. When he dropped you off, I heard him drag someone else away. It sounded like a man. I'm assuming he was with you. I just want to know what's going on. We were attacked by something before we wrecked out. I don't know who this person is that put us here. I'm just so confused. I babbled to Claire, trying to repress a sob. Confused and scared. Really scared. Claire slowly shook her head in agreement. Well, I'm sure by now you've figured out that they aren't game wardens. Claire replied. That's what worries me about my sister and fiancé being out here. They? I asked curiously. There's two of them, Claire said. The one you probably saw. His name's Kurt. I don't know who the other one is, but they're working together. I recalled seeing the body with Devin when we were walking back from the brook. Pretty sure the other one's dead. I said flatly. Devin, the guy I was with when your sister and fiancé found us. We found a body earlier. Something had tore it to pieces, but I remember he wore the same thing as Kurt. You said his name was. Claire nodded. I guess he got what was coming to him. She said coldly. Trying to remain stealthy, we quietly proceeded down the trail, keeping an eye out for any movement. Despite our wariness, we lightly conversed, during which Claire brought up her missing daughter. Seven years ago, Claire said that she was in a bad place where life was all about catering to her hopeless addictions. Having a child didn't quell their dependency, and it drove her to sell her own baby for what she described as a life-altering amount of cash. After getting back on our feet, Claire spent these last few years trying to find her daughter. After finding the man that she had sold her daughter to, who turned out to be Kurt, Claire spent time tracking him and learned his ways for an organization called Wild Jigan. All she knew about them is that they run some kind of underground operation, and one of their compounds is located in this national forest. Clara said that she had infiltrated the property a few days ago, but got caught before being able to uncover anything more about Wilge again. She clearly had been held in that abandoned foundation for quite a while, and didn't appear to fabricate anything that she had just disclosed. So her story, although outlandish, was believable. Stop. Claire said sharply, holding out her arm to keep me from walking further. Tensing sharply, I froze. Just ahead of us was a small clearing, where we heard something squirming on the ground, whose movements coincided with an unrhythmic metallic rattling. Upon creeping closer, it was revealed to be a person chained to a tree. My blood froze. It was Devin. Before I could take another step, Claire grabbed me and knelt us down behind some cover, giving a shushing gesture with her finger. There is a stand in one of those trees, she whispered, nodding towards the clearing. I can't tell if anyone's in it. After verifying the stand was unoccupied, Claire gave the okay before we rushed over to Devon. He was bleeding from his head and had a black eye along with some scrapes and bruises, but was pretty coherent. 
Devin's hands were bound and he had a metal collar around his neck, whose chain was embedded in the tree that he lay against, essentially leashing him to the spot. He perched right up when we had appeared, quickly replacing the look of terror in his face with relief. Me left about a half hour ago, Devin said, who despite being clearly elated by our arrival was nowhere near at ease. He said that he's using me as bait. Devin said Tobias and Gabby managed to get away, and the man, we presumed to be Kurt, who chained him up, left the stand to track the pair. I think he's going after what was in Tobias's car. Devin replied when asked what he thought the man was trying to hunt. Claire, who brought Devin up to speed on everything she had told me, reiterated that she didn't get far enough into the wild chicken compound to know any more than we did about their doings. Even after describing everything I remembered about what had attacked us, Claire was clearly unsettled by the implications, but just as clueless on what we could have encountered. And noticing the collar's clamp looked relatively flimsy, we unhatched a plan to free Devin. Dragging a large, flat rock over, we had Devin position the collar's backside on its smooth surface and intended on smashing it with another stone. Despite how dangerously close we were to inadvertently injuring Devin, it took four good bashes before the collar finally broke. And knowing anything nearby probably hurt our racket, we quickly resumed moving down the trail, feeling a little more settled when Devin mentioned Kurt headed in another direction. Devin said whatever caused Tobias to crash slipped out of the SUV when it finally came to a rest, and it was even shot at by Kurt. He secured Devin and I first, thinking Gabby and Tobias were both dead, and he set them aside. According to Devin, Kurt said he needed live bait since they were attracted to movement. Tobias and Gabby regained consciousness about an hour after Devin got chained up, and snuck away before Kurt realized that they had fled. You were out of it, Devin said about me after the rack. You kept slipping in and out of consciousness, babbling and murmuring. He had no idea what was going on. We continued moving for another couple of minutes, doing our best to stay out of plain sight and keep an eye out for Kurt or other potential threats. It was well over 100 yards away, but through the trees, we made out a road. Despite feeling hopeful about being a huge step closer to safety, I refused to let my guard down until we had reached a civilization. I'm pretty sure it's the same road Braden, Corey, and Shane said they would be on. Devin said anxiously as he picked up his walking speed. Putting some distance between us as Devin eagerly tried reaching the road, I was about to say that he should slow down, when he released a high-pitched shriek and dropped to the ground. To my horror, a small child-sized person with fleshy light beige skin was wrapped around Devin's leg. The child had a long, grimy, unkempt hair that ran down to her knees and released a series of gargly, grumbly growls while viciously digging her teeth and fingernails into Devin's calf. Before Claire or I could intervene, a larger mass had emerged from the brush. What I could only describe as a hulking, deformed human stepped between us and Devin. Its skin had a similar colored tone as the little girl attacking Devin, but was severely misshapen. Its left shoulder and arm were abnormally broad and muscular. The being's right arm was missing and its chest looked firm, but you could see the ribcage's outline. The large man's torso narrowed towards his hips, connecting to a pair of legs with thighs thick as tree trunks. It was covered in brown and gray blotchy patches that I couldn't tell were mud or actual skin. Its most disturbing feature was a light pink soccer ball sized growth protruding from its neck that seemed to absorb part of its face's left side. Appearing uninterested, the alpha-looking male snarled at us with its awkwardly bent nose and twisted toothy mouth before facing Devin. The child-sized female, whose face and hands were coated in blood, excitedly pranced around Devin while he hollered in hysterical agony on the ground. Both his calves had massive chunks of flesh missing, with some areas even exposing parts of his tibias and fibulas. The alpha male swiftly broke off a thick tree limb and began ruthlessly bludgeoning Devin, while the little girl wildly cheered out her gargantuan counterpart. Let's go, Claire whispered and pulled me from the graphic scene unfolding. 
The last thing I saw before looking away was the alpha male pressing its unnaturally oversized hand against Devin's head, whose skull began to cave under the mounting pressure. We took off in another direction, which the two beings didn't seem to notice or care about, remaining preoccupied with Devin's lifeless body, beelining towards a forest's edge. Claire raced ahead of me and was first to reach the road. I watched Claire sprint out of the woods, but at that same time, the road bend she burst out to was illuminated by a yellowish-white glow. No sooner than realizing there were headlights, whose luminosity seemed to swallow up Claire, I heard two loud thuds mixed with the screechy grinding of a vehicle abruptly breaking. Screaming Claire's name as I had emerged, my fears were confirmed that she had been hit by the oncoming vehicle. I quickly dropped to my knees alongside her, who was out cold, and brandished a fresh set of cuts and bruises from the impact. Frantically shaking and tapping her face, I checked Claire's pulse, exhaling in relief when I felt its slow redundant beats in her neck. Where did you guys come from? A familiar voice blurted from my backside, during which Gabby appeared next to me, falling to her knees and scrambling over Claire's unconscious body. While she whimpered and desperately pleaded for her sister to be okay, a heavy hand fell on my shoulder. I quickly turned to Faze, who was behind me, and was overcome with relief upon seeing that it was Brayden. He was clearly distraught over hitting Claire and repeatedly asking if we were okay, while the others spilled out from his truck. I saw Corey and Shane, but was surprised when Gabby and Tobias also exited the vehicle. They both rushed over to Claire. While I spoke with Brayden and the other SCAR team members, Brayden said that they had found Tobias and Gabby alongside the road, who filled them in on everything that had happened, and mentioned how we ran into each other. I was suspicious about the other SCAR members running into Tobias and Claire at first, but ultimately figured it wasn't that great of a coincidence, since we were probably the only ones running around out here at this time of night. Fortunately, Claire came back through and was having an emotional reunion with her sister and fiancé that I had to cut short after reminding them of our dire situation. The other SCAR members didn't comprehend the magnitude of what was happening until I revealed that Mitch and Devin were both dead. Shane was really rattled by the news who neared a point of hysteria before Shane and Brayden got him in the truck. After we had loaded up Claire, I made sure the trunk was empty before Brayden began driving. Clara was still dazed from the impact and fell in and out of consciousness throughout the drive. Gabby tried keeping her awake and alert, fearing she might have suffered some sort of head trauma and didn't want her sister dozing off if that were the case. We initially intended on heading back to civilization for help. However, when the ranger station came within view, we decided to check it out, since we were at least an hour from the nearest town. Brayden pulled into these stations a dirt lot as we briefly inspected our surroundings before exiting. A few lights were on inside the two-story cabin, and Gabby pointed out someone who appeared to be sitting at the main room's front desk. Gabby, Brayden, and myself entered the cabin, while Tobias, Shane, and Corey stayed with Claire. Upon entering the ranger station, we were aghast at the bloody mess that greeted us, which centered around a body slouched over in an office chair. The office was in complete disarray, showing clear signs of a violent struggle. The ranger's body was missing its arms, entire upper right side of his face and jaw. Four large gashes ran in different directions across his chest and abdomen, from which blood and bodily entrails that spilled from the gaping wounds formed a tight circle around the chair containing the body. Not a pretty sight, is it? A man said as he entered the office from a darkened room. He was already like that when I got here. I reckon they did this to him earlier in the night. But I just did a sweep of the station and I assured you, it's just us here. This man had on the same uniform as the dead ranger. A forest green button down in beige khakis that was covered in red and brown stains. He also wore dark boots and a black cowboy hat covering his short black hair. He had pale skin, a lean toned figure and was well over six feet tall. The man had a narrow face, a short cleft chin, dark eyes, and a thin goatee. What kept us frozen in place was the revolver openly displayed in his holster, and bolt-action rifle pointed in our direction. It's you, 
I said sternly, immediately recognizing him as the man who had abducted me from the car rack. Kurt, he smirked. Yeah, I'm still ticked off you guys ruined my bait station. Kurt said, gesturing outside with his head. I had a good setup there. You're sick. Why are you doing this to us? Gabby asked in a shaky voice, clearly terrified by Kurt's reappearance. We just want to leave. I'm here cleaning up your sister's mess. Kurt replied sneeringly. During our tense exchange, Braden drifted towards a nearby CB radio. He was two or three steps away, when Kurt quickly turned towards the table that it was on and fired a round from his rifle that shattered the radio into pieces. Everyone either screamed or violently winced at Kurt's shot, which filled my ears with an intense ringing. Kurt began yelling and shaking his rifle. Although the ringing in my ears prevented me from hearing what he said, I slowly stepped back, sensing from his body language that he wasn't in a joking mood. When the ringing finally subsided, the first thing I heard was a guttural, thunderous scream coming from outside. It'd be smart to get your friends inside before they close in. Kurt sent an acknowledgement to the shriek that undoubtedly came from one of those hideous creatures. Brayden opened the door to go outside, but Shane and Corey were already a few steps from the cabin entrance. Kurt came out with us, keeping his rifle trained on the impenetrable darkness. Gabby told Shane and Corey to get Claire from the car and bring her inside, during which Kurt fired another round. I and a few others saw what he was shooting at, the small child-sized creature darting in between two trees, which accelerated our urgency to move Claire. She was semi-conscious when we had reached the car, and needed our help getting on her feet. Shane and Corey pulled Claire out and guided her, while Brayden and Tobias stayed close behind and hurried them into the cabin. While returning inside, Claire tripped on a step and almost fell, but Corey managed to grab her in time. Claire was wincing in pain when we got her inside. The stumble she took appeared to have injured her ankle. I stood a few feet from the doorway and I watched as Brayden, who was the last to enter, was about to step inside. When a pair of feet landed on his shoulders, appearing to have jumped down from directly above the entrance, a hand from the body these feet were attached to sank its claw-like nails into Brayden's eyes, who released a horrifying scream and stumbled backwards before falling. Brayden's attacker jumped to the ground and stood over him, and sank its claws into either side of his lower abdomen in a single motion, essentially latching onto Brayden's broad figure. While it maneuvered to stand above Brayden's backside, I caught my first glance of the being, an adult-looking female, she had a mop of frizzy black hair that ran the length of her back, containing clumps of dirt twigs and leaves. Her lips looked like they were torn off, exposing her reddish-gray teeth and gums, while her large, manic black eyes were surrounded by thick, dark red circles. Her saggy, wrinkled skin had a brownish-orange tint, and was also littered with gray and brown blotchy patches that were indistinguishable between actual skin or grime. The feral-looking being started dragging Brayden from the door, but not before Kurt grabbed onto his arm. He tried heaving Brayden back into the doorway, taking the female by surprise, whose one hand slipped out of Brayden's side. I caught a brief glimpse of the fiend's claws, more so resembling thick fingernails about three to four inches long, with pointed triangular tips, before she thrust them into another spot right above Brayden's head. He continued wailing in torment as Shane rushed over to grab Brayden's other arm, during which the female firmly planted its feet on the ground and started dragging Brayden from the door. The pitch of Brayden's screams heightened and were accompanied by a sharp ripping sound, which was the bean's embedded clawed fingernails slicing through his sides, creating deep wounds that slowly began stretching his abdomen. I stared, horrified at Brayden, whose beet red face was matted with perspiration and expressed the blatant unbearable agony he was undergoing. It prompted me to run over and help, when a whitish pale flash slammed into the doorway. I could tell just by looking at its menacing green eyes that this was the same being that had attacked us in Tobias's car, 
which look like a mature male, but significantly younger and physically inferior to the mammoth alpha figure Claire and I had encountered. While trying to force itself through the doorway, the fiend didn't acknowledge me while opening its gaping mouth filled with misshapen teeth and furiously clamped down on Kurt's arm. As Kurt hollered in pain, Tobias and Corey rammed their shoulders against the door, trying to prevent the male being from getting inside the cabin. I was completely speechless, unable to budge while comprehending everything going on. Kurt and Brayden simultaneous screams, the ongoing tug of war over Brayden between us and those monstrous savages, and the same creature that had attacked us earlier on the verge of bursting into the ranger station. I was on the verge of succumbing to panic when I noticed Kurt's rifle leaning against the wall unattended, along with his holster being completely exposed. Rushing over, I instinctively grabbed Kurt's revolver and cocked the pistol, while Kurt screamed for me to shoot the fiend whose jaws were still clenched around his arm. I shakily held out the revolver and squeezed the trigger, firing around that at the very least and grazed the creature's head, which was enough for it to release Kurt's arm and retreat. Corey and Tobias pushed more of the door shut, but wedged Brayden, who was now convulsing and spurting blood from his mouth in the entranceway. Shane grabbed at Brayden's arm, urging him to hang on, which was when I noticed a growing bulge protruding from his stomach. He released a gargled scream as the bulge grew bigger, until four distinct points formed under his shirt and cut through the fabric, revealing it to be the female's clawed hand. The vile being literally sank its hand into Brayden's back and pushed it completely through his body. Shane was so petrified that he lost grip on Brayden's arm, who was swiftly dragged outside in what felt like an instant. Tobias and Corey slammed the door shut, while Kurt reeled on the floor. Shane, who I stood behind, remained frozen in terror, staring at the spot where Brayden once lay, his lip quivering and widened eyes containing an expression of astonishment and fright. And Kurt was completely focused on his arm, which had two bite-sized chunks of flesh missing, and bled profusely. I was closer to the rifle now, which I brought to the other's attention before taking two quick steps and snatching the firearm with one hand, while pointing the revolver at Kurt. Tobias rushed over, who quickly retrieved the rifle and trained it on Kurt. Still grimacing when he faced us, Kurt seemed to disregard the two guns aimed at him, remaining more concerned about his mangled limb. Shane wedged a chair beneath the doorknob and noted the first floor windows had bare shutters over them clarifying that the ranger station was more or less secure for the time being. Corey checked the rest of the cabin while Gabby tended to Claire, who she had laid out on a couch in the adjacent room. Despite Brayden's ongoing muffled screams and sounds of him getting torn apart, we didn't take our eyes off of Kurt. All right, Kurt gasped, gritting his teeth while undoing the button down he wore and began wrapping it around his arm. I guess I got a bit of explaining to do. Brayden's screams and any sounds of movement outside faded after a few more minutes. Corey threw a sheet over the dead ranger and wheeled his body into a back room. Tobias and I kept the guns that trained on Kurt, while Shane made sure both cabin entrances were secure. Gabby, who I learned was a nurse, found a first aid kit for Claire, who regained consciousness. I cut them, Kurt said nonchalantly after he noticed Shane and Corey trying the phone lines and internet. I'm trying to keep this as quiet as possible. You're all struggling to realize that. The heck are you talking about? Tobias asked after a brief pause. Kurt took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. The people that I work for. A wild again, Claire said, unexpectedly walking up alongside and staring menacingly at Kurt. He works for a group called Wild again. Kurt was silent for a few seconds before awkwardly nodding to confirm Claire's comments. Who are they? Tobias asked sternly. Kurt smirked. They'll keep this quiet if you prevent me from doing it. Who are they? I repeated demandingly. Tobias said to ask a third time before he finally responded. They're a hunting club. Elaborate, Tobias barked. Sighing, Kurt slowly hung his head, clearly apprehensive about revealing this information. There is a special kind of hunting club. A very, very unique, exclusive, secretive one. That sly smirk returned to his face. 
The group was supposedly found in Germany sometime in the 30s. They, they breed and raise humans. To be completely feral, primal with predatory animalistic instincts. They pump them with steroids, hormones, and other chemicals to manipulate their maturation rates, physical growth, bodily senses, and their brain development. Our jaws dropped as we exchanged perturbed glances. All of us clearly unsure how to respond. Why? Shane, who migrated over to us with Corey and Gabby, had asked. Think about it. For these elitist big game hunters who bagged every conceivable trophy out there, what better feat to pursue than an apex predator of their own kind? One that's smart and strong enough to hunt you back. It's the ultimate challenge for them. One that they'll pay top dollar for. Kurt nodded towards the door. They're simply called untamed. Those things outside that we're hiding from. They're wild Jagan's creations. They breed and raise them in controlled, cordoned off environments where they spend their days killing before being killed. Those things out there, they're humans. Actual human beings. Tobias asked excitedly, his grip tightening on his rifle. Kurt shrugged. Genetically, just as human as you and I. And this is the group you're loyal to? Gabby asked. I'm loyal to circumstance. Kurt quickly replied. I'm loyal to the moment. Kurt confirmed that Wild Jaken did indeed have a compound in this national forest. He said when Claire had infiltrated the property, she had entered through the hunting grounds and left an opening in the fence large enough for five untamed to escape through, before that it was discovered. Kurt and another mercenary, the man Devin and I had found earlier, were tasked with eliminating the escaped untamed. They disguised themselves as game wardens so they could roam about more freely, and despite being able to track them pretty handily, only killed just one of the five. Claire confronted Kurt about selling her baby to him seven years ago, who said that he had remembered the exchange. And to Claire's infuriation, he was very dismissive about the ordeal and returned to scrutinizing us for sabotaging his plans. I was going to focus on the untamed first and then deal with you guys after, Kurt said when explaining why he held Claire and I captive. One problem at a time. The other guy was dead white, but his dumbass getting killed forced me to do everything myself. He didn't know what he was getting into. And not for nothing. If you guys didn't screw up my bait station, your one friend would probably still be alive. You just made things worse by freeing him. You were using him as bait. Corey snapped, stepping towards Kurt, before Tobias held out his arm to keep him from advancing. <laughs> like I would actually let him die. Kurt replied pompously, rolling his eyes. I'm a marksman. I would have picked those guys off before they got anywhere near him but you all decided to screw it up. What happened to her? Claire asked in regards to her daughter. Kurt scoffed at the question. How am I supposed to know? That was seven years ago. I don't even do that kind of work anymore, getting new specimens. Kurt exclaimed, acting like Claire's question wasted his time. If what you saw outside is any indication, she's probably all messed up like they are by now. Assuming she already hasn't been bagged by a client. And what are you going to do even if you find her? Recondition her to be normal when she never was in the first place. Gabby and I had to restrain Claire, who tried charging at Kurt. I'm sorry, but that's what happens when you stick your nose where you're not supposed to. Kurt said arrogantly, his cocky smirk only making Claire irate her. We had nothing to do with this. Corey angrily shouted. We were only doing our Bigfoot show. We were minding our own business. We got pulled into this unknowingly. Kurt burst out laughing. Well, now you know there are scarier and realer things in the woods to watch out for. Take me to the compound, Claire demanded, freeing herself from mine and Gabby's grips as she stomped towards Kurt. I know that's where she is. It took years, but I'm getting answers now, and I'm not leaving here without her. Pulling out a knife that she had concealed on her person, Claire pressed it against Kurt's neck. And so help me, if your people hurt her in any way, I'll start with you, she grumbled, the blade breaking skin on Kurt's neck and drying blood. A few of us reminded Claire it wasn't possible to go anywhere right now, not with the untamed lurking outside, but she ignored our remarks, keeping completely focused on Kurt. 
Gabby tried urging Claire that he wasn't going anywhere and he would answer to authorities when he got arrested, which caused Kurt, who seemed amused by Claire's aggressive actions, to chuckle. I'll tell you what, Kurt said. I'll bring you if we get out of this alive. So, figure something out. Claire pressed the knife harder against Kurt's neck, while Gabby and Tobias begged her to stop. Just ignore him, Gabby pleaded, and clearly afraid Claire might do something bad. I know he's a bad man, but you'll be right back here where you started if you do anything to him, Tobias added. We've got things under control right now. Listen to them, Claire. Corey chimed in, locking his hands together to make a begging gesture. Claire didn't budge until the sounds of glass shattering came from upstairs, followed by thumping footsteps of more than one individual that moved in different directions. They were getting in sooner or later, Kurt said softly as Claire eased up on the knife against her neck. They're smarter, craftier, and more cunning than they appear. Don't underestimate them. This is practically an art form for them. They kill things just to kill them. While trying to track the footsteps overhead, everyone formed a tight circle around Kurt and Claire. Three thunderous bangs jolted the front door, followed by a deep grating roar-like scream that completely occupied our attention. Dropping from the catwalk directly above us was the child-sized untamed. It landed on Shane's shoulders, similar to how the other female had jumped on Brayden hooked one of her arms around his neck, and began furiously attacking him with a sharpened stick. Chaos ensued in response, during which the female untamed that attacked Brayden rushed down these stairs, blindly swinging her sharpened clawed fingernails. Shoot it! I heard Corey yell at Tobias who stood near Shane. Shane's frantic shrieks and cries filled the room, as blood spilled and spurted from his face and neck. Although shaking, Tobias nervously raised a rifle, looking like he was trying to set his aim as he loaded around into the chamber, while Corey and Claire repeatedly screamed for him to shoot. In what felt like the blink of an eye, the child-sized untamed jumped off Shane right before Tobias fired the rifle. Shane's entire jaw and right side of his face exploded in a plume of red mist from the shot, causing Gabby and I to start screaming hysterically as his body dropped to the floor. Tobias was in absolute shock, preventing him from noticing the adult female untamed, which tackled him and started fiercely slashing at his face and arms. At this moment, I realized the revolver was no longer in my possession. Panic set in while I manically scanned my surroundings as Tobias desperately cried for help, and Gabby screamed incoherently in the background. I spotted it near the front door, but Claire scooped up the gun first and didn't hesitate to empty its remaining rounds into the untamed on top of Tobias. Her thick crock of hair made it hard to see if and where any of Claire's shots had hit, but the untamed stiffened posture and its slowly falling over indisputably confirmed that it was dead. That's how you get him off someone, I heard Claire whisper, clearly referring to Tobias's fatal mishap of Shane. Claire and I got Tobias back up who suffered some serious wounds. The worst was a deep gash across his face that split open his left nostril, gums, and a side of his lip, which dangled off at the edge of his mouth. Where's Kurt? Corey asked, whose question made me freeze. Kurt was gone. Gabby pointed out that he left through the back way, which was now slightly ajar, and viewable from where we stood. Another rattling thud jolted the front door which started to splinter. Unconfident that the barricades would hold, we hurried towards the back door, during which we heard three more bashes come from the front. We managed to get outside before the front door finally broke down, and the large alpha male entered. Outside, however, the child-sized untamed stood between us and Claire, who was trembling uncontrollably. From where we stood, I noticed more details about the tinier female untamed, namely its deformed right arm, resembling two sausage links or an hourglass of a small section of her central right forearm became abnormally narrow, with any part beyond that point appeared completely limp, and covered with patches of grey brownish purple discoloration. The non-functional hand's short chubby appendages, however, did have what looked like different sized hooks and fingernails embedded in their stumps and lieu of fingertips. A flash caught my eye when the untamed shrugged its shoulders while slightly turning her right arm in our direction. 
my blood ran cold. I now understood why Claire, who stood quivering with tears rolling down her cheeks, was so emotionally paralyzed. The flash that caught my eye was a pink, heart-shaped charm. It dangled from a thin gold bracelet that made up the narrowed area of her disfigured forearm. The most disturbing detail was how the bracelet appeared, permanently embedded in her skin, whose arm apparently grew around the band, causing the malformation. Reminding myself she was a little girl, I whispered a soft, No, under my breath when I put everything together. This was Claire's daughter. She found her daughter. I was partially unnerved by the child and tame's grotesque face. The sides of her mouth had deep cuts into her cheeks, making it appear like she always brandished a wide, fleshy grin. It was what the untamed proudly perceived as a standoff. Claire was actually having perhaps the most revealing moment of her life, facing the morbid reality of her past actions and consequences. I'm sorry, I heard Claire whisper as she slowly dropped to her knees. I'm just so, so sorry that I did this to you. She started sobbing as the girl walked up to her, whose face's rabid hostile expression beamed with anticipation. Claire continued weeping and tightly embraced her daughter when she came within rage. Unfazed by Claire's affectionate gesture, the untamed didn't hesitate to bite into her neck. As the life slowly drained out of Claire's body, she looked accepting of her fate, like she had achieved peace of mind and a means of reciprocation for depriving her daughter of a chance to live a normal life. The child viciously extracted a mouthful of Claire's jugular, whose body went limp. And despite his grave injuries, Tobias screamed in anguish and broke away from us to make an already vain attempt to save his fiance. He managed to take just four or five steps before getting blindsided by the other male untamed, who had emerged from behind the cabin's a natural gas tank. The bean tackled Tobias to the ground and chomped down in his hand that he had extended towards Claire. The struggle made me jump into action. I grabbed a glass shard that I had spotted near the dumpster and raced towards Tobias, who had two of his fingers bitten off by the untamed. The fiend was exacerbating Tobias's facial wounds by slashing and digging his fingers into his gashes while he screamed and writhed on the ground, trying to escape from the monstrous fiend's unforgiving grasp. The untamed turned towards me at the last second when I ran up and jammed the glass shard in one of its oversized eyes. Shrieking in agony, the bean fell off Tobias and desperately grabbed onto its face around the glass shard protruding from its eye as it wildly squirmed on the ground. Although Tobias was reeling from the additional trauma that he had suffered, I started dragging him away with Corey's help, who unexpectedly froze and looked back at the cabin. It's burning! Corey blurted out, pointing at the ranger station, from which black smoke was pouring out of the back entrance. Unless one of the untamed did it inadvertently, I suspected Kurt had started the fire as a distraction to help him escape, or destroy any evidence of what had happened that night. Probably both. I became alarmed when flames started emerging from the back door, which I realized was adjacent to the cabin's natural gas tank. We need to go, now! I barked at Corey while trying to keep Tobias moving, who could barely stand on his own. Before rounding the cabin, I looked back to see the untamed that had attacked Tobias was gone. The little girl, however, remained and continued playfully dismembering Claire's body. She bit off so much of Claire's neck that her head was bent at an unnatural 90 degree angle. Her body made unsettling, grotesque, twitch-like gestures. As the girl continued on, alternating with a sharpened stick and bare hands. Pausing, I blocked out Corey furiously asking me why I had stopped, and completely zoned in on Claire's daughter. It just wasn't right, I thought. This little girl should be an ordinary person, but wasn't given that life. Instead, she was brought into this unfathomable existence. I partly resented Claire for letting this happen to her own flesh and blood, while continuing to observe the girl's barbaric primal instincts in action. There really was no saving someone like this, I thought, getting overcome with a heavy sense of sorrow upon deducing. This little girl was inevitably doomed and unconformable. 
We can't just leave her here. Uh, let her live like this. I said softly, completely disregarding the burning cabin. What are you talking about? Corey asked anxiously, while readjusting his grip on Tobias. We need to put her out of her misery. I said woefully. I mean, look at her. What person deserves to live like that? And a little kid, no less. She doesn't even know that she's human. The untamed noticed me watching while she was rubbing her pointed stick up and down Claire's exposed ribcage. Snarling at me, her disfigured face darkened as she made hostile, low-sounding growls, while flashing her teeth like dogs do in standoffs. She started advancing towards us, shifting between walking bipedally or crawling on all fours. I blocked out Corey's frantic cries telling me to run, and heard him shuffle off with Tobias. And despite the ravenous desire to kill in her eyes, the kind of ferocity you typically only see in an animal stare, I wasn't afraid of the little girl. Whether it was the pity I felt for this reprehensibly tragic outcome, or the strong sense of guilt experienced out of seeming obligation to continue Claire's remorse on her behalf, I remained where I stood. Upon coming within three or four yards, the girl started moving in like a large circle around me, shifting in a sideways crab-like crawl on all fours, whose movements looked too unnatural for an actual human to make. She was clearly waiting for the right opportunity to pounce, during which she continued growling and snarling while moving in that orbital motion, keeping her front side facing me the whole time. The untamed was about to rise from standing on all fours, when a loud crackling boom rang out, causing my ears to ring. When I looked back at the little girl, there was a baseball-sized opening in the center of her chest. I watched its eyes roll in the back of her head as the life escaped her monster's face, as the untame dropped back on all fours before collapsing on her side. I looked behind me and saw Gabby standing a few yards away, holding Kurt's rifle. She started jogging in my direction, urging me to get away from the cabin. Flames continued shooting out from the back doorway, and they were beginning to envelop the gas tank. My dire sense of urgency returned as I gave the body of Claire's daughter one last glance before making my way around to the front of the cabin. Smoke poured from under the crevices of the ranger station's front door and the window shutters, while an orangey glow came from the second-story windows. Scanning the vicinity for Tobias and Corey, I quickly noticed the smears and splatter marks of blood along with other bodily pieces scattered across the cabin's front porch, the wooden ramp, and the dirt lot. There was a large hunk of meat wearing tattered remnants of clothing on the ramp that I quickly identified as a Braden's remains, who they had tore to pieces. Before adequately processing the macabre scene, Gabby and I stood before her. My eyes drifted towards Braden's truck, which was our best means of escape. Corey emerged from the other side with a worried look across his face, and confirmed what I already dreaded. We don't have the keys, he exclaimed, gesturing towards the car with his hand, as he came up to myself and Gabby. It's unlocked, I got Tobias in, but he's in really bad shape. And Brayden, he still had the keys. Corey's voice faded as he visually acknowledged what remained of Brayden's body. The three of us looked at each other, knowing a surge of his body with time not on our side was inevitable. We warily moved towards the ramp where Brayden's body lay, our cautious approach largely influenced by the hands-on task we were about to perform, and then the sweltering heat and flames now seeping out from under the cabin's front door. Forming a semicircle around Brayden's body, we hurriedly inspected it and the surrounding area obviously hoping to see the keys laying somewhere so we wouldn't have to start sifting through the body's pockets. There, Gabby said softly, gesturing towards the bushes growing alongside the ramp. Gabby pointed at Brayden's severed hand, which tightly clenched his truck's keys. Initially scrambling away from the severed limb, Corey, who was the closest, turned back and looked at us, knowing that he had no choice. Taking a slow breath, he pressed down on the hand-severed end with his foot, while unraveling its stiff fingers to obtain the truck keys. Corey's face was green when he had retrieved them, and started running towards the truck but stopped about halfway to vomit. After his episode concluded, Corey reached the truck, but abruptly stiffened and grabbed onto the sides of his head with both hands. 
No, Corey murmured, his face filling with dismay. When I realized what Corey was reacting to, my heart sank. We didn't realize it earlier, but all four of the truck's tires were flat. While coping with this crippling setback and realizing our only way out of these woods was now on foot, a rush of fury swept through me as I envisioned the individual who was definitely responsible. Kurt. That son of a... I whispered under my breath, looking at Gabby and Corey who both had wide-eyed aghast expressions of trepidation and uncertainty. We walked around to the passenger side where Corey loaded Tobias in the back and were greeted to a grisly scene. Blood was splattered across the vehicle's entire side, and its back door was wide open. Along the tree line, we saw the alpha male untamed standing over Tobias who lay face down. Whether he was conscious we'll never know, as we helplessly watched the alpha male grab Tobias' head and make a series of sharp, twisting motions, completely turning it like he was removing a bottle cap. Each turn produced a series of squishes, crunches, and pops, while the hulking untamed stared at us with a deranged, maniacal expression, clearly exhibiting the pleasure it got from killing Tobias. Corey screamed for Gabby to shoot the being when it finally severed Tobias' head, which he began to inspect with majesty and wonder. And despite her shaking limbs, Gabby unsteadily took aim and fired a round that managed to strike the untamed's swollen shoulder. Dropping Tobias' head, the fiend recoiled as it shrieked in affliction, pressing its massive hand over the gunshot wound as it angrily faced our direction. Stepping forward, the alpha male looked ready to charge, but tensed up and appeared to gaze beyond us, the frenzied look in his face quickly fading as it appeared to contemplate its next actions. While Gabby struggled to discharge the empty round she fired, the alpha male snarled at us one last time and scampered off into the forest. We looked at each other in bewilderment for a few seconds, before turning to see what the untamed had reacted to, the flame engulfed cabin. No sooner than we all faced the ranger station, we heard a high-pitched hissing that instantly reminded us of the natural gas tank. With no other options, we sprinted from the burning ranger station. My estimate we got about 15 to 20 yards before the tank finally blew, consuming the cabin in a giant fireball that ejected millions of debris pieces in every direction. The deafening and explosion's ferocity threw me into a muddy ditch alongside the road, getting dazed from the harsh impact as my body slammed into the ground. Unable to move, I stared out into the woods, focusing on a ridgeline about 100 feet from the road. I don't know what I saw next or if it had anything to do with what happened to us, but just as I had spotted it, a solid black humanoid figure with a round cone-shaped head ducked behind the rocky ridgeline. I couldn't make out any more details. It definitely wasn't an untamed, and it looked too broad to be a person. The lighting wasn't spectacular and I may have only imagined it, but I didn't dwell on it for long at the time as I quickly became occupied with the sense of feeling returning in my limbs. Looking back at that moment, however, maybe just maybe I actually saw what we originally came here to try and find. It's hard to say. The blast attracted enough attention for someone to send help, which took over an hour to arrive. We were treated for our injuries and gave testimony on our versions of what had happened that night. Despite our correlating stories, the absence of definitive evidence, at least according to authorities who seemed skeptical, made our accounts impossible to verify. The remains of Mitra Devon were never found, nor was there any mention of the untamed or other identified creatures in the final report. It officially stated the explosion was caused by a heated system malfunction that happened to occur just as the SCAR team arrived at the ranger station to report their team members, Mitch and Devon, missing. The report stated we came across to Gabby and Tobias whose car broke down and gave them a ride. Perhaps what bothered me most was after reading through the final report, I noticed that there was no mention of Claire or her missing daughter. Any efforts to reveal what actually happened that night were futile. As far as I know, the untamed that got away are still lurking in those woods. Kurt is probably still working for the mysterious Wild Jaeger organization and might have succeeded in hunting down the remained untamed for all I know. I've tried contacting Gabby and Corey, but neither are willing to revisit that night. 
and it's hard to function regularly knowing a heinous organization like Wild Jagan exists, whose sole purpose is turning innocent unsuspecting humans into monstrous predatory game that gets hunted for sport. I wonder how many untamed have been deprived of a normal life, and turned into these vicious, feral beings that if anything, shed light on how close we as humans are to our primeval origins. Seeing what I saw and knowing what I know for me, this story, which started with covering a group of amateur Bigfoot researchers, was far from over. The events of that fateful night only scratched the surface of this dark, hidden truth. The Catskill Appalachian Research Collective investigates and advocates advancement in the study of various fringe sciences and 14 avenues. If you're interested or curious about anomalies like cryptids, paranormal, and other unexplainable phenomena, follow or join the CRAC Facebook group and subscribe to the Beyond Explanation YouTube channel, which features the team's bi-weekly podcast, From Behind Tall Trees. All information will be linked in the description below. Check it out if you're interested.